Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Krista Fabian De Castro, and I'm the Senior Manager for Artist Engagement and Programming at Creative Capital. Hopefully, many of you are familiar with Creative Capital. For those of you who are not, Creative Capital supports innovative and adventurous artists across the country through funding, counsel, and career development services. As part of our mission to amplify artists' voices and provide communities of support, we have created a series of free online workshops and conversations specifically designed to help artists deal with the current time of change and upheaval. We also have an extensive list of arts resources on our website, which is creative-capital.org. And we keep adding to these efforts as the current crisis unfolds. So please check back regularly and make sure you're subscribed to our newsletter and social media for all the latest updates. The topic for this conversation is adaptive platforms for artists' resilience. Our guests will explore ways in which artist-centered organizations are pivoting to accommodate artists' needs during COVID-19 and evolving in the process and share what they're using to maintain community and share resources through repurposing, expanding, and innovating their programs. We intend the session to be as interactive as possible, so we encourage everyone to use the YouTube chat, both to connect with each other and to ask questions of the guests. Our staff will be filtering the comments through to the guests and they will try to answer as many as possible. Without further ado, I'd like, you to introduce, I'd like to introduce you to our guest. Our moderator is Kyle, Kyle Dakuyan. Kyle is a poet, performance maker, and executive director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's in New York City. We've asked Kyle to guide today's conversation because we were inspired by the thoughtful and nimble solutions that the Poetry Project has taken in moving its programming online and the organi organization's thinking about how to widen possibilities for engaging the liveness of poetry in the future. Kyle is joined by Ali Rosas Salas, Director of Programming at Abrams Art Center in New York City, Tara Aisha Willis, dance, dancer and Associate Curator for Performance and Public Practice at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and Detroit-based Creative Capital Awardee artist, Wesley Taylor. Finally, we're pleased to offer American Sign Language Interpretation, courtesy of Purple Communications, and we welcome our interpreters, Tiffany, and Kelly, who you will see on screen as well. Welcome Kyle, Ali, Wes, Tara, Tiffany, and Kelly. Thank you, Krista. Um, I'm Kyle DeCoyan. I'm the executive director of the Poetry Project at St. Mark's. Um, I'm joining today's event in that role at the Poetry Project, which has been presenting live readings, performance, and other work out of St. Mark's Church in the Valley since 1966. We are committed to continuously and critically engaging the history and future of our presence in the space. And as part of that, we would like to acknowledge that our venue, as well as the place I'm speaking from today, are built upon unceded indigenous lands, specifically the territory of the Lenape people. We recognize the continual displacement and violence perpetrated against indigenous people and people of color in the US and are aware that these kinds of acknowledgements can be misused as stand-ins for actual decolonization work, which is something for us to bear in mind as we go forward in our ongoing commitment to accountability, reparation, and equity. We hope that those tuning in will feel welcomed and included in this work from their own respective places as well. And as one step toward that, we encourage you to visit the resource at nativeland.ca, which we'll place in the chat or um, whatever function we're using to communicate with guests today. Um, I want to extend appreciation to Creative Capital for thinking about and organizing today's conversation and for guiding us with some lines of shared inquiry, which I'll be presenting just to help move the discussion forward. So I'll be somewhat of a facilitator and a participant. And I think part of what's so special about the care brought into this event is that there is so much adjacent and divergent experience, knowledge, and depth of feeling present among this particular group. So I wanna just voice appreciation as well for Ali, Tara, and Wes, and I hope that we all feel encouraged to raise new questions and respond to thinking that may surface in the course of this discussion. Um, and before we jump into questions, um, I'm just gonna offer everyone the opportunity to introduce themselves, um, 
share their pronouns if they'd like to, and share a little bit more uh, before we get into the discussion. Um, so let's start with Ali, if that's okay with you. I think Ali may be frozen, so we'll, um, or maybe they're back now. I'm sorry, Kyle, did you ask me to begin? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Sorry, I got a little frozen there. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much um, for sharing space, digital space with us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali Rosa Salas. My pronouns are she, hers. And I'm the programming director of programming at Abrams Art Center, uh, which is on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. And um, at Abrams Art Center, which is part of a social services, a social services agency called Henry Street Settlement, which I'll definitely speak to more um, as our conversation unfolds. Um, I direct our performance programming, our residencies, our, and our visual arts programming. Thank you. Tara? Hi, everyone. Really happy to be here. Um, my name, uh, you know my name, it's on the screen. Um, my pronouns are she, her, also on the screen. And um, I'm currently speaking from what's, what's known right now as Chicago, the homelands of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. Um, I am uh, working at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago as associate curator for performance and public practice. So, um, you know, it's a contemporary art museum, but within that I'm part of a several person team that's focused on uh, presenting performance. We have a theater, um, a longstanding performance uh, series, um, but also, you know, uh, recently combined together with a really amazing public programs team and finding all the blurry spaces in between across the museum for live arts and events and discursive contexts. My focus is on performance. Um, and like was mentioned, I'm also a dancer and a dance scholar. So my, my personal focus is on dance, but I'm very um, uh, invested in and um, focused on in, in my work across dance theater and music. And again, all the blurry spots in between that. Thank you. And Wes? So, uh, Wes Taylor, you see that? So I'm, I'm um, beaming in from stolen um, Anishinaabe land, uh, which is situated off of many estuaries and great bodies of water known as the Great Lakes, AKA Detroit, Michigan. Um, and I kind of straddle a couple different geographies. So here in Detroit where my practice is based, the location where I am now is my studio, Talking Doll Studio, which has been in existence for maybe uh, maybe 10 years, it's hard to count. Um, but that is, um, yeah, this has been a place of refuge for me in a lot of ways. And then my other locale is Richmond, Virginia, where I teach at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, in the graphic design department, in the art foundations department, um, I'm part of many collectives, that's how I work. So my main collective is Complex Movements where we do a lot of immersive and interactive um, performance work that is like kind of couched in hip hop and uh, electronic music, house, techno. Um, and we try to merge science fiction, uh, complex science, other science ideas and, and create weird performance work that has to do with like social and movement building. Um, I also have a practice as just like a straight up graphic designer sometimes. And I help run and own and operate this space. And then I come in as a curator, which is some of the work that I'll be talking about today, thinking about stuff going on as COVID as far as exhibition. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll stop there. And if some of my other identities as an artist come up, then, then I'll speak to those. Thank you, thank you. And again, I'm Kyle from the Poetry Project. My pronouns are flexible. Um, the work that we do at the Poetry Project has 
uh, in the past usually been to present anywhere between 60 and 75 live events a year, ranging from readings to performances to lectures. Um, we also offer workshops, a fellowship program, different publications. I think probably like the work of everyone who's participating in this conversation today, we're also very invested in community formation and gathering, uh, which I think is going to be a focus of, of what we talk about today. Um, so just as a starting point, um, let's maybe talk about what has been your experience helping artists cope and process the current moment. And I recognize that this word moment is plural and expansive and shifting. So please, please feel free to engage that uh, however is most meaningful to you. I'm happy to, to start. And, and I'm also happy to, okay. I'm also happy to, to um, um, uh, call on folks as we move through, if that feels all right. Um, we at the Poetry Yeah, yeah Project, if you want to call. Sure, sure. And another thing is, you know, I think all of us experience different uh, technical vicissitudes. So as those come up, we'll just roll with it. Um, uh, the Poetry Project has a, a, um, a pretty tightly bound community of, of 300 or so uh, poets and artists and performers who we're working with in any given year. Um, I think a number of those people overlap, for example, with the community that Ali is working with at Abrams and Henry Street Settlement. Um, and uh, we are closely in touch with, with artists who I think are experiencing um, one uh, uncertainty as to what the form of their work is now and will be in the future. Um, we're closely in touch with artists who are processing um, different kinds of grief relative to those uncertainties and relative to dramatic changes in their practices and communities. Um, and, and we're also working really closely with artists who are experiencing different kinds of material precarity because um, so many people um, who are pursuing creative practices are also people who are um, kind of in um, among the most uh, vulnerable work and employment positions right now. Um, so I don't know if if any of those things resonate with, with experiences that you all are having, um, but I'd, I'd love to uh, make space for some conversation around that or, or hear what others are, are experiencing from their respective places. I'm happy to speak. Can everyone hear me? Thumbs up. Lovely. Um, I think, I think the past four months have symbolized a tremendous, um, awakening. I think the conversations that are being had are certainly not new conversations, but more people are understanding how these conversations are directly relevant to themselves and their survival. Um, I think particularly working for an arts institution because uh, there, there's, there, there's no way that we can gather publicly or host performances or exhibitions. It's really been one, um, uh, an opportunity for us to reevaluate our, our values and our mission. And when we speak of ourselves as a presenter and an artist services organization, what does it mean to be in service of our communities now? Uh, so that's that's really been um, transformative and will continue to to transform. Um, but I think that this moment, because we don't have you know our our regular operations up and running, it's really been a moment for us uh, to uh, realign with with mission and vision. 
um, and be responsive and pours not only to what uh, staff are needing and wanting, and Kyle definitely echoing um, navigating grief, both personally and professionally, um, and then uh, so navigating that in community as a staff, but also being responsive and pours to the needs of artists. And um, really, really shifting gears in terms of what our role as a presenter is, um, especially because we're not presenting shows or exhibitions in the traditional sense at the moment. Um, I think right now, uh, given given the the tumultuous times we're in and that we'll be continuing to navigate, um, we've been really critically examining the resources that we have and how are those resources being distributed, um, of course, equitably and quickly and urgently, and how does that, um, at this point in time, uh, supersede anything else that we could be doing programmatically? Um, so, so continuing to remain porous, and, and that, that shift, which I could speak to more later, was due directly to conversations with artists around precarity due to loss of income, uh, for a lot of service industry gigs and, of course, um, other professional artistic gigs. And then also, I think, a huge identity shift or reevaluation of one's relationship to art and life that I think there are a lot of larger existential questions that we're asking in community with the artists and, and neighbors that we work with that has really um, given us, I think, the, the much-needed opportunity to, to pause and to reevaluate what it is and why we do it and how to and how to do that work intentionally and with integrity. Um, I can follow up on that kind of continuing this uh, uh, institutional <laughs> um, piece of the conversation um, and in an even bigger institution context. I think um, one thing that's been really important to me has been figuring out how to navigate um, the ways that I'm interfacing between artists and the institution I'm working with, the resources we have, like you said, Ali, and, and how we're pivoting in our own ways um, and how I can make sure that the conversations I'm having with artists show up in the ways we shift. Um, and, um, and also that I can make those platforms most useful to artists, you know. Um, it's also, yeah, um, and, and I think it's also been for me a balance between that and figuring out the ways that my sort of institutional power can be deployed outside of the institution in certain ways. So, um, you know, being part of conversations that, um, you know, are happening here in Chicago with other organizations or, or you know, through, through orgs that are more on the ground with Chicago artists. Um, how can I be part of those conversations and put a little of my institutional power behind them? Um, and also, you know, certain projects that are about sort of benefiting uh, artists in the future, in the new future that we're living in and, and that we're going to be entering, you know, for example, working on this um, document, creating new futures that has been really pivotal for conversations around dance and performance specifically and, and ethics for artists um, as they're being revealed <laughs> uh, to be very, very um, problematic the way they've been set up. So, you know, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's a lot about, you know, and then also with the uprisings that have been happening and the, the calling out that's going on right now that's so crucial um, and is often aimed at institutions, um, you know, there's a, uh, a, real, a real, like, urgency to my role as interface with the institution, between institution and artist. I think that um, that was always there, but it's really on the surface right now. Um, and you know, folks are really coming to me with questions about what is going on inside this institution that's sort of the pillar, you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, of a certain um, size, you know, visibility of contemporary art and performance and, and work within Chicago. So it's really. Um, I can provide that link I see in the chat, yes. Um, but yeah, it's been really a, a sort of powerful moment for me personally to sort of reconcile these different ways that I operate in the field um, with each other. And, um, and also, you know, the conversations I'm having with artists are about 
you know, how are you pivoting? How are you shifting your practice? Like you said, rethinking what it even means to be a performer right now. But they're also about how do we build in enough downtime to do that work? You know, I think we're we're also think looking closely at our mission and reevaluating the core things about our program. But I think so many people are doing that about their artistic practice. And, um, and so I, you know, um, figuring out how to, how to support that time, you know, it's very hard to do within an institution to support our own growth time, you know, um, which we need to have right now because the way we program needs to shift in a lot of different ways. But I think it's also um, been really powerful to try to squeeze into that conversation the way that artists also need that downtime or that reflection or that, that the work right now is really different for a lot of artists than it was. And it will be, it will continue to be for a long time. And what about for you, Wes? Um, I mean, I, I think about different roles because supporting artists, especially since I work so collaboratively, it means like supporting people that I move forward with as an artist. Um, but then it also means the artists that I support that I don't work in collaboration with. So for instance, and, and just thinking about like time scales of certain decisions that were made, um, a couple months ago, six weeks ago, eight months ago, and then seeing what is happening now. Um, so for instance, like my studio, where we've been for the past maybe eight years been running a residency program, and, and the conversation was, how do we continue that? Uh, and you know, prior to the summer, the conversation was, well, let's wait and see, and what's happening in the decision was, let's do it, right? And so, as of right now, doing that and having studio space, working space, um, congregation space, um, still thinking about social distancing and things like that has proven to be really um, good up until now. Uh, I think a lot of things are moving forward. A lot of practices are moving forward. Um, and then noticing like a lot of stops and starts, even in my own practice where I have a collect my collective complex movements where for me, I would have been on the road all summer if things had gone according to plan. And I've had to just stay put, right? But then that means the time, the in-face and interface time that I have with my collective has been cut short. So we basically just like held space for each other to hold conversations, to see how people are, each ones are doing, you know, on a weekly basis. And even though we were supposed to be in full swing of production, slowed that all the way down, but then, it's made space for me to like return to like a lot of the music that I've made and, and revisit um, older collectives, um, like my original like hip hop group. Um, we've been like really active in this time and which has been really interesting. Um, but then also thinking, you know, presenting exhibition in my role as a curator where in the, the work that I'm doing with the In Light Festival, which is a light festival that happens in November um, through a gallery um, called 1708. Usually it's at one site and we invite a lot of artists to come by and, and, and make installation work for it. And this year we've decided to disperse the sites and make them all around Richmond to see how that works, but then also include other input. So prior it would just be a call for artists we've actually had a call out for people that we call stewards of sites and then calls out for community groups to, to, if they want to land artwork within their community, then they have the option to like also make proposals, which is a brand new format for this particular show and has yet to be seen what's gonna happen, you know, looking out into November. So that's, you know, a few, a few things. Um, and then just to call out, Another hat that I wear is a network that I run is um, a Design Justice Network. Whereas another been there's been another stop where I you know talk, like um, Tara and Ali were like thinking about like um, vision and how that becomes really important at a time like this where we've actually had to really really think about our vision as a network moving f moving forward and have been confronted with all kinds of problems that have kind of like jammed our progress. Um, in a time where there's like a lot of mobilization going on um, in a network with a lot of like 
um, activists and, and community centered people. And um, without proper intentions and, and vision, you can see where you just have to stop and, and recognize that and then move forward from there, no matter what's happening, you know, in the world. Did I, did I pause? It seems like Kyle may be frozen. Oh. Yeah, I think Kyle may be frozen. These internet connections out here are really <laughs> challenging. Okay, well, I got a quick question yeah. if we're still alive to the world, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> so can we, can, Tara, could you speak? Oh, Kyle, you're back. I'm back. I missed the very end of what you were saying, but, um, but I, I, from what I did here, which was most of it, I think, and from what uh, Tara and Ali were sharing as well, something that seemed to be emerging was um, this recognition that we're, we're having to navigate very um, practical obstacles, which are constantly shifting, but there's also like a bigger um, macro level of considerations with regard to equity that the pandemic is surfacing that have been present um, before the pandemic. And that's amplified as well from the last uh, month, more than a month of, of uprisings now. Um, and I think, you know, we're all finding that these are interconnected, that these contexts are not discrete from one another. And so I'm curious within that to know um, how this mosaic of circumstances is affecting the audiences and communities who you're working with. If those audiences and communities have changed or expanded, or if they've had to contract, um, or if you're finding that you're working with long-term audiences and communities in new ways. Do you wanna start us, Ali? Sure. Why not? <laughs> I think there's a bit of a lag on my end, but I just want to make sure that folks can hear me. Okay, great. I think I, I think the nature of our audiences um, at this time, I think, I, I mean, I guess I interpret that question from like multiple vectors. I think um, we definitely have internally um, had a question question that I know a lot of presenters, curators, and artists have um, around presentation of work and the priority that that takes, especially in a, at a time like this. Um, and, and especially because, you know, prior to, prior to stage four, at least in New York, we weren't permitted to even host outdoor presentations. So a lot of, a lot of, uh, of our work was relegated to digital platforms and um, given a lot of the conversations we were having with artists who um, we had made uh, already made commitments to present with, there was an overwhelming, uh, resounding, I would say, uh, um, refusal to make work. Uh, I think that that's shifting a little bit more. I think that there's that's shifting a little bit more now. But I think that there was this initial um, toxic capitalist desire to, to, to produce in crisis that I, I would even say that, of course, in my desire to um, hold on to any semblance of normalcy I had left at this time, um, had a moment where I was considering, well, maybe that's what we should be doing, but was um, very, very quickly um, um, uh, put in my place and, and, and re-pivoted. Re um, and that was really due to um, the, the, the real economic uh, trauma that, as Tara had mentioned, the Creating Futures um, document that she and uh, she's working on um, and, and, and from conversations and lived experience that I know I, I have had um, since, since being um, in this field, um, 
this moment was really a moment where we don't need to be making work. We need to, we need to be making money. Um, and this is like a longer term, this is a longer term concern due to the gross inequities of um, the, the, the arts uh, economy and the field. Um, and then in the short term, um, many of the artists we had made commitments to, uh, to present with uh, had lost jobs, had lost all other sh uh, sh revenue streams uh, until the end of 2020. So there was this real urgent need and request that uh, as a service organization that we work to fill that gap. Um, and then, you know, it, it, in addition to, in addition to the, the artists that we present, we also work with a cohort of theater technicians, art handlers, who were similarly in, 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 in this position. Um, and, and then in addition, our broader Lower East Side community, um, many of whom are communities of color, uh, low income essential workers, um, finding that they didn't qualify for unemployment, uh, they, they couldn't get to and from work or they had lost their job. Um, so, so for us, you know, in, in response to that, we launched uh, a, a artist community relief fund, which was inspired and informed not only by our, our conversations that we were having with, with artists and theater technicians and producers, but the community, the, the history of the Lower East Side and what we were witnessing was happening in our own neighborhood, the kind of mutual aid work that was already happening on the Lower East Side. So definitely informed by all of those conversations and models to redistribute the funding that we did have um, remaining for, for the rest of our season to um, uh, reallocate those funds into um, cash assistance uh, for uh, artists based on Lower East Side, for parent artists, for, for black artists and arts organizers, and for indigenous artists and arts organizers. Uh, so uh, it's a it's it's a grant that we believe, um, you know, post COVID, I think is, is something to uh, uh, for us as a service organization to continue to how to continue to consider how we can serve um, folks in, in that way, providing cash assistance without this uh, necessity for product, which I think um, is definitely a, a, a major question that the field is is coming to terms with around labor work productivity uh, resource allocation reparations so the artist community relief fund was really a way that we could expand that resource distribution um, beyond the the artists and curators and uh, theater technicians that we already had relationships with and expand it to the Lower East Side and and throughout uh, New York City so that's that's one way that we've we've pivoted, and then an additional way we've pivoted to um, ostensibly, I guess, serve audiences that may or may not have already been coming to Abrams was partnering with Henry Street Settlement to uh, start a food pantry, and um, the food pantry um, has already delivered over three hundred thousand meals, um, and we service uh, Lower East Side residents, and um, the staff for the food pantry is comprised of uh, Abrams Art Settlements, uh, Abrams Art Center staff, and also a lot of theater technicians, as I, as I was saying, who uh, many of whom who've, who've lost work uh, through this pandemic and, and uh, local, local residents. So that's another way that we haven't necessarily, I don't think, I mean, I think our audiences have expanded and grown because the, the nature of creativity and service has had to adapt in this time. So. The distribution of food, I think, is a, a hyper creative practice, and uh, the redistribute the redistribution of cash also, you know, d takes a, a another level of creativity. So I'm excited about the ways that the even the notion of creativity is is expanding to adapt to 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 be in service and in community uh, with 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 our neighborhood. I wonder. Um we've been directing people to that fund because I, as I mentioned, I think we have real overlapping communities. Um, I'm really eager to hear a little bit about um, the food distribution program and whether or how that came from staff or if it was something coming from artists or if it was a program that's kind of 
um, emerged in uh, collaboration with these mutual aid uh, initiatives and groups that you're mentioning. Um, because I think there's, again, yeah. sort of work we're doing too. That's a great question. I mean, I think that this is probably the time where I could share a little bit more about our relationship with Henry Street Settlement, which I think is um, really unique and I and and uh, and is a relationship that I uh, have always been um, creatively inspired and informed by, um, but but also particularly in these times, um, their partnership has been absolutely instrumental. So Abrams Art Center is a program of Henry Street Settlement, which has um, it's a, it's a social services agency that has existed on the Lower East Side for over 127 years, um, was, was founded in the mission to support newly arrived immigrants uh, to, to the Lower East Side with access to quality health care, uh, food, other kinds of social services. And artistic practice is always considered part and parcel to that mission uh, of social service. So I feel really honored to, to, to work at a, at a social services agency that has always understood arts and culture as critical to, to, to wellness. So um, Henry Street has had a long standing commitment to food justice on the Lower East Side. Um, that's one of the first initiatives that the organization took on when it was, when it, when it was founded. Um, it already has a robust food distribution program um, for, for youth and for seniors. And so when uh, the pandemic hit, um, our, our former director of, of production uh, was identified as someone who has the, the producerial organizing skills to, to take this kind of work on, um, the, the kind of logistical, creative adaptation, being able to build and break down very quickly so within the agency, um, uh, you know, the, the, the leadership of the agency recognized that um, arts workers also are essential workers and have the capacity and, and creative thinking skills to um, assist in, in the food uh, redistribution services that Henry Shee had already taken on because we knew that it was going to have to expand and expand dramatically very quickly. So that's how that came about, and and I'm grateful that we're able to um, provide work for a, a lot of theater technicians um, who've lost work due due to the pandemic. A lot of Abrams Art Center staff who have had to uh, who have been redeployed um, to 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 work in that um, initiative. So it's, it was already aligned with what Henry Street uh, Settlement has already been doing, but mm -hmm. arts is considered an essential service within our organization, so we were brought right in. It sounds like an amazing synthesis of um, work that's in your history and in your community and present among the group of people you're already working with. Um, what about for you, Tara? How has your relationship, um, your work, shifted with different audiences and communities? Yeah, very different situation. Um, I was really loving hearing you articulate. I mean, I know Abrams well, but it was lovely to hear the articulation of um, it as an organization that's first goal is, you know, essentially social justice and art is understood as core within that. And so I think, you know, I, um, I think in a museum context, as, as probably most of you can imagine, we're negotiating what it means to be in a almost op an opposite <laughs> relationship, you know, um, and and it's just it's been so core to how so many of the curators at MCA for a really long time have thought about their work, their programming, and the artworks and the artists they they are bringing into the building, you know, to think through social justice in different ways, um, and to think about their the way that artwork is a um, a social necessity, you know, um, and 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 yet there's so many infrastructures still to be shifted in that way. Um, so I, I guess I'm um, saying that all to pivot in a way, and which is like a word that keeps coming up in this conversation, which is interesting in and of itself. Um, I think one of the things about the performance program at MCA um, through its long history since you know the beginning of the museum but in the theater since the mid 90s um it has been it's really beautiful um combination of working with local artists and 
national and international artists, sort of, you know, recognizing the importance of Chicago communities and artists and audiences experiencing what else is going on in the world live. Um, and also, you know, the ways that our platform can really be crucial for local artists um, as they, you know, build their work and branch out beyond Chicago. So one of the things that's happened is a shift in that. We have to really, you know, the museum in many ways is like, okay, now we're really focused on Chicago because there's no tourism. You know, it's all about Chicago artists. It's all about Chicago audiences. Um, and in a weird, strange way, you know, while programming and, and online space and, and all the other creative ways we're coming up with to create programs um, beyond exhibitions, are sort of core to what we do right now suddenly, um, instead of the other way around, uh, we are actually able to hit an, a really broad audience potentially, you know, uh, an international audience. There's no geographical boundaries around our work right now for the most part. Um, so that's been an interesting conversation to be inside of. And so I'm, I'm really excited by the ways that certain programs, we're still testing the, the playing field and seeing what works, but certain programs have really brought together an audience across distance that otherwise wouldn't get to experience that work that might be live in our building. Um, and that is often based on a, a set of networks out in the field that already exist or out in the, you know, in, of sort of cultural interest. So we did a project a couple of years ago um, called Relations where three really brilliant choreographers, B.B. Miller, Ishmael Houston Jones, and Ralph Lemon um, improvised together. And that footage is like gold in the dance world, you know, but there's such, um, you know, specific boundaries around how documentation circulates around performance. And we did a watch party and made that footage then available for, it's still up, I think through the 30th on our website. And during the watch party, which had a moderated chat, um, it was just incredible, the sort of dance scholars and professionals and folks from around the country who were in that conversation, watching these three folks, you know, in this sort of historical event that's historical, both in how amazing it was at the time and the fact that it already happened two years ago. Um, so, you know, that was such a successful event, I think, because it brought together, it, it really piqued the interest of people who have a specific thing in common that they care about. Um, and so I think we're trying to figure out ways of not duplicating that, but um, rallying that uh, as we go forward. Um, it's not necessarily about hitting the biggest possible audience. It's also about finding folks who will be in conversation with each other and not just sit and silently watch while they make dinner, but actually be in the chat. And, you know, like part of our goal with, with programming is to, to create discursive spaces, you know, so... Um, so that's just one of the findings that we're working on. And I think the, the space for growth um, is really about also how do we do kind of the reverse for local artists? How do we actually, dig in digital space and all these other ways we're finding to connect with audiences, how do we expose audiences that MCA may have um, in other places to artists that, that are here in Chicago who may be um, more often in front of a local audience? I hope that made sense. Um, so yeah, so, um, and, and then the other piece of it again is connecting audiences with each other, you know? So how do we, whether that's that just that chat box or, you know, finding an event that's gonna be partnered across multiple organizations in the country and bring audiences into the same digital space rather than, you know, some weird digital version of a tour, you know, that we actually can all just have the same event and share a, you know, a digital theater in some way, you know, what does that look like? So those, I think it's, there's so much experimentation still happening with it and, and testing, but those are some of the goals I think we have around um, shifting how our audiences work. Mm -hmm. Across the experiences both of you are sharing, I'm, um, I'm realizing and paying attention to the opportunities to in some ways be more local or newly local and and the opportunities to be more global or newly global um and that's been that's been striking for us at the the poetry project where so much of our work is about people gathering in physical place to listen to poetry together and the ways that that kind of radiates outward from our very local manner 
um, because now the now the work that we're sharing is um, on a weekly basis reaching audiences who wouldn't ordinarily pass through our physical space at St. Mark's Church. Um, and to the point that you're raising, Tara, um, it's also an opportunity for, for audiences to um, newly engage with one another with a spirit of, of localism that maybe wasn't available before. Someone on the West Coast can be having um, an experience in a poetry program that we're having over Zoom that's really closely in discursive space with someone based here in New York City and someone in Chicago and, and, and folks all around the world as well. Um, so it's, it's just interesting to track those, um, those different apertures that we're, we're moving through. Um, how are you experiencing this, Wes, with the, the audiences and communities who you're working with? Um, I, I think it's interesting, right? Because there's like, there are a lot of things figured out and then like there's this horizon of things that of ideas and formats and and certain frameworks that weren't in place with the institutions that I'm working with that are now about to be used. So we're gonna see, but what I find is interesting as these things start to come online and become live and, and start to go out there in the world is, you know, with, with the show in Richmond, for instance, the call out for communities and spaces, we found that the people that jumped on it first were the larger institutions. And so the larger, because we're a smaller institution moving forward in this weird uh, territory, right, of still continuing to do something that will be live and not digital, um, we'll have digital components, but it will be real people at a place as the main thing. Um, the other institute, the larger institutions were like, cool, let's be a part of that as an extension of, you know, earlier these networks of support that kind of emerged in Richmond amongst the institutions. Um, when things first hit, now there's an extension of this and, and part of the, the show, which is themed um, safety and accountability as the title, right, as thinking about these safety networks um, but we also had to tell these larger institutions like hold back because we are trying to distribute the resources for this show to um, places that are less likely to hold artwork or to distribute the funds of this work into directly into communities. So after we put a call out, we have to make like a, a brand new document to say, actually, larger institutions, we are glad that you are interested and want to help support this effort. But these are the conversations that we're going to have to have about the dynamics of power of the resources that you already have and the things that you already had set in motion. So we would love to play and we would like to work together. Um, but can we sit down because you're either going to have to help us in our efforts to distributing these um, resources or kind of fall back in, in a way. So. You know, so that's like one instance of like resources and unexpected um, and unintended consequences that have to be figured out in real time. And still, I don't know what the what the result of that effort is going to be yet. So, and what about physical space and how that's bearing upon the work we're doing? And, and Wes, in the work that you're doing with Talking Dolls and the In Light Festival, how are um, navigations around spatial restrictions and, and space uncertainty bearing upon your work? Yeah, I mean, I'll just go real quick as like a continuation of that. For InLight in particular, we actually had a site set and we were ready to go. And so we had a site, we had everything going, and then we decided, wait a minute, um, we're actually not going to be curating with my um, curatorial partners and, and the directors of the gallery were actually going to be crowd control experts at the end of this. And that's not what we wanted to do. We didn't want to figure out who needed to be where, when, how we could uh, manage flow of groups of people. That was just beyond the capacity that we had. So 
space became multiple spaces in thinking about, well, can we do this in a way that we don't have to manage flows of people, which still is yet to be determined if we just made multiple problems for ourselves or not, depending on how this works, right? And so it's like starting to dawn on me, it's like this, uh, this genius idea of like, no, let's just like put it multiple places and like dilute the crowds may still have to, we still may have to be responsible for crowds in a different way. Um, and, and so here in the studio, we kind of was just like in, in a more lax way where in with the residency, we said, you know, we'll have a schedule. Some people are on one day, some people come in on another day. And, and that's worked pretty much all summer as flow of people work. But I think it's good um, when you have, like having space and pretty much control over the space. Um, we've been able to like set some rules and and people have been pretty respectful of those things so far. Yeah. I'm reminded of, um, I had been uh, listening to a talk with Fred Moten and Stefan O'Harney who, and, and we have been thinking about this in our own work too at the Poetry Project about how so much of our ideas of kind of utopian cultural community have to do with crowds, crowded rooms and crowded spaces. Even as we've been thinking about uprising, I think so much of that is oriented around crowds and being physically together. And what you're saying, Wes, reminds me that um, it's, both an opportunity and an imperative that we have right now to reimagine what constitutes crowd and ways that we can um, manifest a spirit of encounter that maybe doesn't require physical proximity in shared time. Um, and it's uh, both a challenge and remarkable to, to see how institutions and artists are pursuing that task right now. Um, how are you, how are you experiencing that, Allie? I think this time has been um, really awakening. I think I've always had an, uh, a deep interest and desire in uh, situating work in public space. And at Abrams, we'd already been we've already been doing that work, um, uh, situating uh, different performances and other kinds of uh, public events, not actually in our physical space. Um, utilizing the the local church or um, uh, a nearby park, or um, we're working on a project at the local pool. So I'd already been really interested, um, particularly because the neighborhood that Abrams Art Center is situated in just has so many um, really frequented uh, community-based outdoor, either outdoor public spaces or other kinds of social spaces that I was really intrigued by curatorially. And that also uh, with regards to your question, I think about audience, um, thinking about really wanting us to expand what it means for an art center to be in service of uh, a community. And does that mean that the activity has to be localized at the center, on the stage, in the gallery? I mean, I believe no. Uh, I believe that we're like the, we have a repository of resources and our responsibility is to distribute those resources. And I was interested by the, by, by the challenges uh, with regards to accessibility um, that, that situating work outside of our, our theaters and our galleries, uh, what that would call for us to, to do. So once, once COVID hit, you know, I, I, felt, I felt that this really was the time for us to be um, definitely moving, moving away from thinking about the, the theater or the gallery as the only place where artistic practice can take shape not only in presentation, but also in residency and development. So uh, at least for our fall season, the majority, well, I would say 99% of all of our programming is gonna be outdoors, whether it's visual arts programming or uh, taking place in our amphitheater, um, our outdoor space, which we're, we're grateful to have um, online as 
well. We'll be doing some digital engagements uh, online. And um, in terms of residency activity, I think this speaks to a, a conversation around accessibility and, 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 the, and the ways in which this pandemic has, re has required us necessarily to be more expansive around this question of access. You know, we definitely it felt important for us, for obvious reasons, to be able to distribute the cash resources to residents to do their work, uh, but not require them to have to be at Abrams to do that work to be more responsive to the needs of artists and community members as time. How do they want to utilize their space, their time? What are their boundaries in terms of what what kind of crowd do I feel comfortable in? Is, is, is a crowd too now? Um, and so I think that that question permeates not only our presentation activity, so the artists that we're working with to um, create live performance work or discursive events, our visual artists and our and our uh, residents, but also audiences. So it's definitely, I think, having to think expansively around uh, um, uh, personal, professional, spatial boundaries um, has really uh, uh, incited a lot of creativity and, and uh, a, a lot of new ways of thinking and creating work and presenting and uh, that, that I think are really, really exciting and I and I really hope continue to unfold in ways that are that are generative. So I've I felt that even though we don't have the theater, we don't have the theater or the gallery, uh, those spaces are also being utilized for the food pantry. So so you know so I think that's that the space is a commodity and it'll be used, but in a way that makes more sense for the moment. Yes, yes, and I'm so grateful that you're introducing this. Um, this recognition that that questions of space are not only oriented around public health and accessibility, um, that space that all of our different spaces bear so much, um, so many power vectors, and that people people relate to spaces and the different spaces that we're operating in in such different ways. It's kind of getting back to. Um, a comparison that you were making earlier, Tara, between the relationship of Abrams and Henry Street to their community versus the relationship of a museum in its justice and art orientation. So I'm, I'm eager to um, know like how, how you're thinking about space from a museum standpoint. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, a couple of things. The program, uh, the performance program was has been, you know, very focused around the theater in, in many ways, at least in the majority of its of its work, even if, you know, most performances were using that space in really unconventional ways, and it is a conventional theater in a lot of ways. Um, but I think, you know, more and more performance over a long period of time has been moving in other ways, and, um, and so this has been almost an invitation to really push in that direction. And I'm, you know, sort of hearkening back to the conversation about communities and audiences. I think, you know, if we're building new audiences or new connectivity across audiences, how do we not lose that after we're supposed to, you know, go back to a regular like performance season, you know? So I think it's really about actually adding these new strategies into how we work um, and, and operating differently into the future. Um, so it, to be honest, it's, there's an aspect of it. Um, there was a period where I really needed to like force myself to look at the beauty of the negative space around the rules <laughs> and be like, okay, so what can we do and have it feel, um, exciting for artists that we're working with and audiences and territorially also, and, um, and not like a limitation, but actually about an invitation to work differently. Um, and, and. And now I'm more focused on how do we move that into the future, you know? Um, yeah, there was another, P oh, and then another thing that I think, you know, there's such a primacy in a museum context around the building and being in the gallery and being, you know, and there's an interesting thing that's happening where, you know, um, there's the way we talked about performance and live art before uh, within the museum, you know, constantly speaking to um, across forms, you know, speaking with people who may not be consistently in conversation with live artists. Um, 
was about the liveness, right? And the being together in the room. And so, um, and yet we've also been, um, I think in some ways the more adaptable part of the museum to the current situation. You know, there's um, such a desire to be back. I mean, the galleries are able to open before we can have events on site but we haven't stopped having programs. Meanwhile, the galleries have been closed, you know? So there's just an interesting sort of way of piecing things together. We're also located in downtown Chicago. So there's a real geographic um, inequity around how people can, who can get to the museum. And that was there already. So, um, you know, I think it's only exaggerated now that um, riding public transportation is really frightening for some and, um, you know, folks are afraid for their jobs. There's a little less flexibility around that off time, you know, um, and all all the myriad reasons that, you know, we can think of. So I think there's a real um, awareness that we're all starting to have. I think a lot of us knew it already, but it's starting to be really recognized at a bigger scale that the building can't be the primary um, only place that our programming happens. I don't know how that will <laughs> affect things going forward yet, um, but in a weird way, being more in the digital space and we're doing some projects that involve USPS, you know, use of the mailing uh, systems and other things, apps, apps and things like that, um, you know, these other methods are actually also making it more possible to do work that is geographically elsewhere than in the museum building. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think it's really crucial to shift in that direction. Yeah. We're, um, we're actually, um, we're thinking really similarly at the project about um, uh, kinds of programming that in addition to having some kind of digital or screen basis, what kinds of programming can we imagine that is maybe more deliberately analog using the mail and, um, you know, using food delivery and object fabrication and other kinds of tactile experiences that people can be engaged in from wherever they are. Um, it, that feels like a great, um, a, a great opportunity to, to be thinking about um, the ki different kinds of engagement that we're, we're having to invent in this moment and which we're maybe finding will need to be uh, more longer term and less temporary. Um, are there, are there kinds of engagement that you all are, are coming upon that are surprising you that, that may feel like uh, they may more permanently become a part of the work that you do? I, I think that the, uh, to Tara's point about the, the watch party, um, I really hope that the, the, the access to archive that institutions have uh, made available to, uh, to to folks to experience. I know Abrams has also uh, done, done done similar work, making our past performance documentation available for viewing for anyone. I hope that ethic of accessibility to archive continues in perpetuity. Um, it seemed in the in the um, in the very beginnings of, of the of the pandemic, that seemed like really the first thing that a lot of uh, institutions and presenters, you know, we had in our proverbial arsenal uh, in terms of content. And uh, even though I know that that push and desire to to present content was 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 coming from a very particular place, I do I am really heartened and inspired by one the fact that there is all of this work, uh, much of which I haven't even seen. And, and two, that, 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 that it's our, you know, for at least, you know, speaking on behalf of Abrams as a presenter and a service organization, I think access to, to information is, is, is a social service. So I do hope that, that, that the access to past documentation uh, continues and it brings up really prickly and complex conversations around ownership of archives, which I know is already a conversation that's been happening. But I think that because there's been this sort of onslaught of, it's particularly with, with performance documentation, 
um, I hope that continues. I also uh, hope, I think it, in the context of um, visual art, um, other kinds of social events, uh, uh, like parties um, and other kinds of gatherings that one might not think of live, live stream, um, ASL, closed captioning. I think the fact that all of these are ways of utilizing live stream technology, um, video uh, to, to, to increase access, I think to bring back the question around how audiences have expanded is really beautiful. And I hope that continues to become commonplace because even if one lives in New York City, they might not be able to go to an event for multiple reasons. So I'm really excited and interested in terms of like how Abrams continues to answer that question and meet that need for ourselves and how the, the how the field will continue to adapt to, to, to how it is that we've you know, answer, answer these questions in the short term for ourselves. Tara, Wes, have, I, I, I love the archive and I'm wondering Tara and Wes, if either of you are thinking about engagement with that specifically in a new way too. Um, yeah, I really second everything you said, Ali, about, um, you know, the the way, the sort of proprietary ways that uh, institutions and artists alike, depending on the person and the place, have thought about performance documentation in the past. And, you know, it's, it's a side effect of the ephemeral, you know, the conversation about live and ephemeral work, uh, you know, that there's um, also so many deep conversations that have been going on for decades about, you know, the role of documentation and when does it become a film that is a work of art in and of itself and on and on and on. Um, and then this moment has raised, you know, it's made us look more closely at the contracts we're making with artists about the documentation of their work. There's been very few or inconsistent ways that that language in contracts actually becomes, you know, usable or <laughs> actionable uh, in the past. And suddenly it's like really key. Um, and I'm not always sure that it's ethical for the artist. So, you know, I think there's a lot to be sussed out there. And, and I also wanted to just raise, this is not exactly the question you just asked, but one of the ways I'm hoping things continue is that a lot of folks are, I'm finding, responding to the current moment by creating more durational work. And that is not necessarily like, here's my installation or, you know, um, you, you know, here's my engagement site visit and then I'm gonna do the show. Although those are all options that are happening. But I think, you know, work where, you know, the audience is asked to call in over four months on different, you know, days and experience something different or receives materials in the mail and then shows up for some other event later. And, you know, so, so structures that actually force us as institutional <laughs> workers, arts workers to, um, not operate in this way where we're advertising one thing at a time or you know little chunks of things but actually re-engage with an artist over time because now any media is suddenly where dance is happening or theater you know so i think there's something really exciting about that as it as it um, both is shaping the work that that approach is changing how artists are working obviously many have already been working that way but it's bringing to light what those practices are out of necessity and at the same time, pushing on institutions to just simply accept that that's work. That is a, that is a work of art. And so I think that's, um, you know, those kinds of projects would have been like, okay, we're just doing this one weird project this year. Don't worry, the rest are touring productions. Um, and now it's like all four of the projects in the fall are like that, you know? So I think that's another way that, um, I guess it, it aligns with the, the archive question in just the sense of how work is circulating in terms of media um, and and the interaction that audiences have with that. Yeah, I think I, I think about time in two ways. Um, going back to like Ali, what, what Ali was talking about um, productivity um, and personally, as an artist, I think the thing that I stumbled upon is time um, and then chilling all the way out, um, which has been major. Uh, like I said, like before, I would probably would have been on the road. Um, I probably would have been at home a total of three weeks. Right. And and working through different residencies and working with different institutions and expecting turnarounds and expectations for something to be done 
or for something to be presented and packaged up in a bow after those things where I've been working at a totally different pace, which is a pace that I knew I should be working at a long time ago. Um, and being forced to do that has been crucial. Um, and the other way that I've been thinking about time, which is a thought that I've had a long time and I, I'm always interested in these conversations, but I think is really relevant is this idea of obsolescence um, and, and what needs to stay, how long something needs to stay, when it should go away um, and fold up and, and, you know, go into the ether or, you know, its parts turn into different things. And so for me as like a habitual starter of things, um, I've really been thinking instead of perpetuity of the thing existing, really, all right, this is a two year, th two, three year thing. And that's really worthwhile for it to be in existence. Um, and, and so, and these are the conversations that I'm having with people that I'm officially starting things with um, in, in, in different timelines. I love that we're tying together conversations about archive duration and time. Um, I'm, when you started to bring up Archive Alley, I was thinking um, that part of what's so wonderful about the uh, volume of archival material that's becoming available is that in a lot of ways, it's disrupting what I think of as like the received narratives around particular institutions. It's an opportunity for us to really broaden um, the kind of cultural narrative that's come out of our respective places. And as, Tara, you and Wes are both um, bringing up, then there's this, there's this recognition that we can also be working with artists in new ways in present time and time moving forward. Um, there are a few comments that have come in from folks who are tuning in that I just wanna add so that they're out in the air for all of us. Um, someone's shared, we added analog participation to our virtual youth media summit this year, participating artists could call in stories, mail in artwork, and access was more open than ever. Um, someone else has shared yes to finding folks who will be in conversation with one another and not just huge numbers. I think that and both of those comments and, and other things that we've brought up in conversation so far are reminders that there are lots of opportunities that are coming out of this moment, even as we're kind of navigating new complexities and difficulties. Um, Someone who's watching asked, uh, several people who are watching have asked, how are artists thinking about funding right now? And we've kind of begun to brought, bring that up earlier in the conversation, but it would be great to hear from different folks about how you're talking about and engaging conversations around funding with artists in this moment. I guess I can I can start. I think um, the 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 nature of what Tara was saying, what, what Tara mentioned around um, artists and presenters having different kinds of conversations now about contracts because of everything that happened with the, uh, force majeure and and, and and folks realizing what it is that those that legalese actually meant um, on both ends, on both ends. Uh, so, so I think that that that, that was a, a really critical um, uh, teaching moment um, for for everyone, and continues to be, and will continue to be. So, I think that that I guess to to add to add on to um, what's already been said around models and ways of working and presenting that. Are shifting that I that I want to continue and I you know need to continue and actually there's no other choice but to continue in this way. It's for there to really be transparency around uh, around funding, around not only um, whatever it is that a force majeure clause could mean and how that impacts one's commission uh, agreement, but but also also more nuanced conversations around project phasing um, and resources that institutions should be responsible for for providing to artists in the development of work. And I think because of the nature of COVID and, and because of the fact that 
the, the idea of a project timeline and a final presentation is really up in the air. I mean, we could, we could conjecture spring 2021, fall 2021, but I think, I, I, I mean, speaking for myself, I think where the projects that we're investing in now are longer term and have multiple phases. Um, um, and, and that we as presenters who have access to resources, uh, to, to funding and to space and to other kinds of uh, other kinds of resources for the development of the work, we also need to be shifting differently as to how those works are resources across time. And I think that the nature of contracts and it's like you receive your commission fee by X date, some institutions might do that on the, the day of the last performance, some might do that a few months before. So everyone, I think, I think the situation also unveiled. It's like turning on the, turning on the, the lights in the, in the kitchen in the middle of the night and there are roaches everywhere. Everyone's kind of working in their own, in, in kind of their own, in, in their own way, shape and form. And there's not really a, a, a standard institutionally, ethically as to how we should be working with each other, how we should be treating each other. So I think the necess the necessity of one that um, and the disturbing nature of that, and two, the, the ways in which COVID has um, impelled both artists and presenters to slow down and to be intentional around project timeline, the many ways that uh, the project developments take shape, how this needs to be resourced, how this is not a, an, an in your, your in and your out kind of presentation, but that the nature of how this work actually will be presented at some date could be a live performance. How is that resource? Could be a zine, could be a series of video performances. So I think because of the nature of this time and the flexibility that nature is calling for us and has always been calling for us to adapt to and be porous to, the, the talk around money has had to be more transparent than ever in order to resource that effectively and responsibly. But all that is to say is that we know that the nonprofit world is suffering tremendously. We know that a lot of, that sadly, a lot of institutions are not gonna survive this time. It's a, very, it's a very traumatic time. So I think while I say that, and while I understand this time and experience and know from a presenter side that this time costs for more resources, I know that you know many institutions, including my own, are having really difficult conversations around sustainability. So I think that there's vulnerability that around funding that is finally coming to the fore in the field that I hope brings for more transparency, more equity, and uh, a, 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 a way of rethinking redistribution uh, of resources that continues to, 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 to inform how we make decisions and how we support one another. Thank you. Tara, I feel like a lot of what I was sharing there is so connected to what you were bringing up around duration and like how, how we can be more ongoingly supporting artists specifically from a funding perspective. Yeah, I, I second pretty much everything Ali was saying and I'll just like add on some specificity for my situation. Um, we actually made the decision to um, not do live audiences as a as a matter of course quite early compared to some other institutions through this fall at least that's as far as we made the decision for at the time and and it really freed us up to start thinking about how we could support artists um, the the conundrum is that there's uh, the timeline is is somehow because we lost so much time in just dealing with covid. <laughs> Um, and then actually we lost, you know, some, we necessarily lost some time around the uprisings because myself included, so many staff were just exhausted and unable to actually work and had to prioritize protesting or, you know, there was a lot to deal with within the institution around that, you know, um, and continues to be. So I think um, the timeline is somehow shorter and yet we're in a time where um, we also rethought um, the projects that we did decide that we could move forward with became commissioned suddenly not necessarily in the traditional way, but we realized that in asking artists to really rethink how they're working, um, we were actually asking them to remake the method and platform and form and content of the work, all of that, even if in some cases it is a pre-existing um, project. 
Um, so the ideas are all there. It's just actually there's a ton of work that goes into translation and reworking into a completely new context. Um, so I think that was a really big shift for us. It doesn't necessarily mean we're able to put more money behind it, but it was a, a shift in thinking about the way we're um, labor, like the labor that re is required and the connection that's required to work with an artist over over that short, uh, too short amount of time. Um, and 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 in in doing that also, you know, the, the reality, even for an institution my size, MCA size, is that budgets are slashed right now. So, um, you know, that's just a, a, a matter of, of fact. And we're figuring out how to do a lot more with less and still pay artists, each artist we work with the same way that we would otherwise. And one of the things that's happened is I think um, in trying to work over more in more supportive on the ground ways with artists than we might you know do across all of our programs less programs is one of the things but also understanding that process is part of a program and so um, what are the ways that we can share out any residency processes or ways that artists are thinking about their work in advance not aiming towards product but really understanding that and this was always core to our department's mission um, but I think it's even more urgent right now uh, because live artists, performers, the, the, the way of making work right now is really in process. <laughs> and so, and so it's, it's a necessity at the same time. Um, so I, I guess in a way that's not uh, fully directly responding to the funding question, but I think it, it speaks to how, I think when we, at, when we talk about funding, it's also about, um, at least in terms of institutions, how that money is coupled with actual curatorial and production support. And I think there's a whole reworking of, of what that is right now. Um, and it's, it's really challenging in some ways because it means that perhaps we work with fewer artists over the year, um, but that support is more um, present to help those artists figure out how to work under these conditions. And Wes, from the from the experience of um, being an artist working with institutions, um, what what would you maybe want to bring into the conversation on how institutions can be supportive with these funding yeah. for artists? Yeah, I mean, I think I think of this from two sides. Prior to COVID, I probably could have run you down on the ways artist strategy to funding in a very expert way. Being, at, being very fortunate of receiving funds and, and understanding how that landscape worked, right? I don't have that same playbook um, now. And you know what I would have offered prior to March is totally different now. Um, and um, coming from, I don't think as a collective, we've applied for anything even since COVID. Um, one thing, you know, just thinking about money and just knowing the flow of what's been happening very like in a very hyper local way um especially to like my practices i think what, what tara is speaking to like there's been this pause and also figuring out right and some things haven't been sorted um in some ways i would say there's a hole in the bottom of people's buckets and their coffers and things are spilling out but i would also say that there's the potential what i'm noticing as a sit and wait approach where coffers are maybe actually feeling um, and people are seeing that um, there are new approaches that need to be taken. So instead of being very reactive and replicating former models, I think people are maybe coming up with new models. And I know that personally from the network that I run, um, Design Justice Network, where we have uh, um, paid membership part of it. and we allocated funds and we knew what some of these funds were gonna to go to to support travel um, prior for our network to meet at um, the Allied Media Conference that just happened last week in Detroit, but it didn't happen in a place, right? And so those allocated funds to travel are not there, but we're still receiving money from membership. And I don't think we are too quick to redistribute those funds because I don't know if we want to replicate old models, right? And so we're really thinking deliberately about how that happens. Um, and, and I think there's a there's a sit and wait 
And then even collectively in my art practice, we had funds allocated for residencies very specifically, and we've had to sit on those. And so we're, we're rethinking those and thinking about like how that works redistributed within our, within our collective, but then um, outside. And, and so I would say that it would, smart, it would be smart to think of things as dire and dwindling, but I think there are rays of hope um, in, in other ways where people are reconfiguring and rethinking um, things and they're just not online yet. Um, and so, you know, hold that as, as an inspiring artist um, in, in, in thinking about this funding conversation. We've had such a wide ranging conversation and um, something I feel really grateful for is that um, it feels like there is a shift that's moving from how can we be uh, responsive and reactive to the context that we're in towards more of a conversation around like how can we uh, how can we leverage some of the opportunities that are before us to fundamentally change how culture works um, to to really address inequities that have been persistent for quite a long time and and move out of a, a production minded model and towards a model that's more oriented toward care and um, and 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 aid and uh, community. So so thank you everyone for um, for making this conversation so rich and um, so exciting. And I'm going to hand things over now to Krista from Creative Capital. Thanks, Kyle. That was such a perfect way to wrap everything up. Thanks again to all the panelists and for all of you who joined us. A reminder that a recording of the workshop will be available on our YouTube page. Um, also, as a reminder, we're working uh, that our next and final session of the series, which is on the topic of artist centering access, will take place next Tuesday, August 4th at the same time. So uh, you can sign up and find out more at creative-capital.org. Um, we're also planning our fall online programs and the best way to continue to stay in touch with us about that and to find out what's going on and the additional resources that Creative Capital and all of the um, wonderful artists and practitioners that we work with, such as our guests tonight, are working on um, is through our mailing list. So we hope to see you again soon. Everyone take care. Be well. Goodbye.